Wesley and Tommy and Jean. Appreciate those reports. I can see that we have more than one youth group in our church. <laughs> All right. Um, you reminded me of something. Wesley's report reminded me that I, I never um, said anything to you as a church family about our semester in personal evangelism. This spring, uh, many of you know that we've uh, been trying to do something a little bit different that would get more prayer involved earlier in uh, our meetings. And uh, we had a good group uh, in the spring. We, uh, our last night, we had four teams out in the field. And uh, there were always some things that caused snags as far as uh, scheduling is concerned. People miss occasionally. Uh, but this was a well-attended uh, semester. We had a lot of groups out in the field each time. We meet up here at 6.30 for about 30 minutes and do some classroom work. And then we go out and knock on doors for about an hour. And then we come back and do a debriefing session where we talk about what happened. Usually in a semester, which is seven Tuesdays in a row, we usually have one or two people uh, at least get saved. Occasionally there's a semester where nobody prays as a direct result of us going out. This was one of those semesters. Uh, but I always tell people in the class, the real goal here is not necessarily uh, to see a lot of people saved or get you know, come into the church because it's not a real effective way of doing that, just talking to a stranger at the door. The real goal is for us to get more comfortable with the idea of using the opportunities that we all have uh, on a daily basis to tell other people about Jesus and to feel comfortable with that. And what we've learned in the last two semesters is that people are open to prayer. And I want you to be confident about that as well. Uh, we used the, uh, the book, The 40-Day Journey of Prayer, that many of you have a copy of, and we recently uh, went through together as a church. And those are going to uh, continue to be uh, around the church. And if you don't see one, but you want some, just ask Kathleen, and she's gotten really good at making notes. Uh, and uh, we will make as many as you want within reason. Uh, and you can keep them around uh, just to take the opportunity to speak with somebody about prayer. Let them know, say, hey, I, we've got a booklet at our church that we've used about prayer. I'd like to give you a copy of it uh, and let you take a look at it. You can see if you, uh, it would be helpful. By the way, is there anything going on in your life that I can pray about with you? Uh, and even for people who say, no, well, no, not really, because sometimes that would happen at the door. Well, not, not really, everything's going pretty good. That in itself amazes me. You know, uh, I don't want to be hard on people because we are strangers coming to the door. They're being gracious to talk to us. They're being honest. But doesn't that tell us something about the way we think about prayer? If you ask somebody, can I pray for you? And they say, well, not really because everything's going well. What's the subtext to that answer? We only pray if we have a need or something has gone wrong. And I understand that. I don't want to be hard on them. But our attitude should be prayer is an opportunity to have communion with God. To if, nothing, if we don't need to ask Him for anything, then we can just pray and worship. Uh, we can pray and thank Him for things. And it's an act of communing with one another when we pray together. So uh, I want to encourage you to, if you haven't read the book, read the book. The book has got a lot of good information in it about prayer. It's uh, just biblical texts about prayer starting in Genesis and going through the book of Revelation. Key prayers in the Bible and some application and encouragement for you to pray. But um, you, whether you've been through the evangelism class or not, Take those opportunities to uh, pray for others and uh, don't just stop there. The whole goal is to try to tell somebody about Jesus. Uh, and uh, after you pray with them, a lot of times people are very open to having a spiritual discussion. And that's the whole point of the booklet. Just try to pray with people and get the Holy Spirit involved in the meeting. You have that sense that there's an open door and that you can step, go one step further and ask a question like this. Have you ever uh, been saved? Have you ever been baptized? Have you ever given your heart to Jesus? And just see how they answer. If they're open and they're willing to talk, 
on, you may get the opportunity to share the gospel with that person and the joy of leading somebody to save the faith. Uh, so we have a good semester, and I want to encourage you to be out there doing that. We're looking on Sunday nights at the book of Revelation. If you would open your Bible, let's spend a few minutes. We're in Revelation chapter 5. Chapters 4 and 5 have what I call five songs, each distinct. We looked at the first two or toward the end of the third one. And the third one is the main song of the five. It has more words in it. Its positioning in many ways is the uh, climax of these five songs. Although there's a climax at the end of the songs also. It's a complex text in many ways. Now the song in chapter 5 begins in verse 9. And it's set up by John seeing a scroll in the hand of God as he sits on the throne, which has seven seals, which nobody is worthy to open until the Lamb shows up, which is Jesus' primary symbol in the book of Revelation. He is the Lamb. And the Lamb is worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, and to see what is inside. The book of Revelation never tells us directly what is inside the scroll, except very soon when we get to chapter 6, we'll see what happens as he opens each one of those seals. And so we can, uh, we can deduce from that that the scroll is the plan of God's judgments and redemption. Some people would say, well, gosh, that's kind of negative. Can't we just have the redemption without the judgments? And if you stop and think about that for a moment, that's kind of foolish. Uh, it's like saying you can have one side of the coin without the other. It just doesn't work. There is no redemption uh, without judgment. Uh, and God is a holy God. So both of those play themselves out in the book of Revelation. We see the judgments of God culminate and climax, and we see the grace of God climax, especially in the new heaven and the new earth. So this song is sung by both the four beings, the four living beings, that were, uh, introduced to us back in chapter 4, and the four elders who were also introduced back in chapter 4. You can go back and look at those uh, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about. It says in verse 9 that they sang, or they sing actually, a new song saying, you are worthy to take the book. Now they're singing to the Lamb, to Jesus. Notice the familiarity. It's in second person. Not he is worthy, but you <coughs> are worthy. The Lamb is right there in front of them. And so they are worshiping him in a very personal manner. And I hope that you, too, also have these times of worship where you're not speaking about God in the third person, but you're speaking to God in the second person. You, because you know God personally. You are worthy to take the book and to open its seals. We would wonder what would make him worthy, and they sing and tell us. Because he was slain, and not just because he was slain, this, of course, is a reference to, to Calvary and Jesus' death on the cross. Because you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So he's worthy because he was slain. And he wasn't slain just to be slain. He was slain to purchase uh, from every tribe and tongue and nation and people. Uh, and he did so with his blood, his life. The blood speaks of his life. Jesus gave his blood. Life. Now, the resurrection of Jesus is never directly mentioned here, uh, but it's all over the room. Uh, uh, the resurrection has to be true, or we wouldn't be talking about the Lamb in the first place. The resurrection had to happen, or the Lamb wouldn't be there at the right hand of God in the first place. So, uh, this vision given to John by Jesus doesn't isn't overtly mentioning the resurrection, whereas it does overtly mention the suffering of Christ, that he was slain. It talks about his blood and the effectiveness of his blood. And the reason for that is because of the, the original listeners were persecuted Christians who were adding their blood to the blood of Jesus in a sense because of their testimony. And so that was an, a, a special uh, interest to them, was Jesus slain. If we're to be slain, we want to make sure that we're slain for something that is worthy. And they see here that 
the one that they're following is one who is slain as well, so that they can trust him. But we've talked about all of that. We've come to verse 10 where it says, And you make them to our God a kingdom and priests, and they will reign on the earth. Now, them, when it says, and you made them, is referring back to from every tribe and tongue and people and language. So, we're being reminded here that the distinguishing mark of God's people is not the tribe that they come from. The distinguishing mark is not the language that they speak. It's not the people that they belong to. Or is it the nation that they are citizens of? The distinguishing mark of God's people is that they have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the basis for fellowship in the church. Anything that we add beyond that is simply not biblical. Uh, if we add something to the basis of fellowship, especially to the things that God has clearly here said, don't matter. Uh, because people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people, uh, they are distinguished by being purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. So he made them. Now, when it says he made them in verse 10, point 8.0, it's using a word that's a very broad and general word, but there's probably a, uh, there's probably a distinction to this usage here that we're meant to see. The first thing that God was worshipped for way back in chapter 4 was what? Who remembers? The first song focused on what? It was because he was holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And so in general terms, we say that's uh, God's attributes, his characteristics. So the first song in chapter 4 is a song about the attributes of God. And the first attribute of God is holiness. That's important. Uh, holiness is emphasized in the Bible, and it's going to be emphasized in Revelation through God's judgments. Okay? So then the next song was about what? In chapter 4. He's worthy, and why is he worthy? Because he is the maker. Now, this is very important for us to notice that God is worthy of our worship because he made us. Period. In, that's the end right there. There's nothing more that's needed for him to be worthy of our worship. He doesn't have to do anything else for us to owe him all of our praise, all of our adoration, because he is the one who made us. Now, he's gone this, an extra step, and he's redeemed us as well. But what we're going to find in the book of Revelation is even the unredeemed will worship God. Even the unsaved will bow the knee to God. They're not worshiping him because he is redeemer, because he didn't redeem them, because they refused his redemption. They will worship him because he is worthy. Why is he worthy? Because he is the creator. He owns everything. This is all his. What's on the other side of this? Nothing. He owns everything. He made everything from nothing, spoken into existence. That's how powerful his word is. And so he is worthy of our worship for that reason and that reason alone. Now, in that second song, it uses the word katizo. He created everything. Katizo. And if we were to go back all the way to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it starts right out with the idea that God is our maker. Here's a funny thing that happens, though, on the way to the New Testament. And uh, stick with me here. This is, this is kind of a scholarly thing, but it's important for you to know. The, uh, the Old Testament was translated into the same language as the New Testament was uh, a couple of hundred years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Okay? So the Old Testament language... Uh, which, was, which was dying. Hebrew was not being used anymore. It, was, it had changed to Aramaic. And the world was speaking Greek and Latin and other languages. And as, as has always been true, 
God's word is not bound by one particular culture or society or language. And so God's word in the Old Testament, just like the New Testament, was being translated so that people around the world and in other cultures could read it. And in uh, a couple hundred years before uh, Jesus came, the Old Testament was translated into Greek. This is the language that the New Testament was going to be written into. It's called the Septuagint. The Septuagint, because tradition says that 70 people got together uh, and they translated the Old Testament into Greek. This Greek Old Testament is the Old Testament that was being used in the early church. And so often when we read an Old Testament scripture in our New Testament Bible, our New Testament Greek Bible, it is quoting the Old Testament Greek version, uh, which is called Septuagint. Now, in the Old Testament Greek version of the Bible, Septuagint, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, for some reason, it does not use the word petizo, create. It uses the word poieo, make. And poieo is used sometimes for create uh, in the Bible. So it's perfectly okay. It's a little bit more broad, general term. Poieo, you make something. Uh, uh, the two words are a lot like our English word, create and make. They have the same connotation. But we can say that God created the world, but we can also say that God was. That he made the world. And in fact, the Greek Old Testament says that God made the heavens and the earth. Poieto. And so this poieto here uh, in this psalm, verse 10, and you made them, seems to be a connection back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And the reason that that connection becomes more evident is because the, as we go through the book of Revelation, there are going to be many lines drawn from the new heaven and the new earth, the new creation, and the old heaven and the old earth, the old creation. See, the motif is this. The motif is that God created the heavens and the earth. And they were good. But what happened? Sin happened. And so they were, they were ruined. And so what does God do? He creates the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, that's a theologically <coughs> sound way of thinking about the broad scope of all Scripture right there, just in that one single idea. God created the heavens and the earth, and sin destroyed them. But God, instead of simply throwing them out of the trash and saying, that didn't work, said, I can defeat sin and evil and Satan and create a new heaven and a new earth. So here's the motif that we have in the book of Revelation. We're seeing this, uh, this new creation. Uh, and it includes, in verse 10, uh, making to God, in a sense creating to God, our God, a kingdom and priests. Now, this is, I ended last week by asking you, where did this come from? This is an Old Testament passage. And uh, I gave you a homework assignment to try to look it up and see if anybody did. Anybody know where this comes from? Kingdom and priests. Jay? Uh, Exodus 19.6. Exodus 19.6 is exactly right. Now, be honest with us, Jay, and tell us if you didn't just look at the, uh, the footnote in your Bible uh, a minute ago and find that. He's, he's not <laughs> But that demonstrates something really important, church. See how easy it is to study the Bible nowadays? My goodness, we are a blessed generation beyond comprehension. First of all, that you have a Bible sitting in your lap in the first place. Do you know how many believers have not had that since Jesus went to heaven? Probably most of the believers who have lived up to this point never owned the Bible. Some of them may have never held or touched the Bible, but they love the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and they had to go to a church or someplace and listen to somebody read a Bible to them and tell them about Jesus. But not only are we blessed with copies of the Bible, and not just copies of the Bible, if you're like me, uh, you can get your phone out, push a couple of buttons, and you've got a Bible right there uh, that you can read even in the dark. You've got a Bible right there that you can read even when you're driving. Don't, I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. And you can listen to things. Yeah, Karen likes to listen to her Bible. Uh, I hear it uh, in the morning coming from the kitchen. All right, so we have these Bibles, uh, and just like these folks a couple hundred years before Jesus, these 70 people who got together and, and produced this Septuagint I was telling you about, how many scholars and lovers of Scripture have spent their lives, literally, their lives, spent them putting together scholarship that has built layer upon layer upon layer, and you hold it in your hand right now. There would be no way to calculate the human hours that have gone into the information that are, is at your fingertips right now. And shame on us if we don't use it. What would those people think? Some of them burned at the stake for what they did so that we can read the Bible in English and have a bunch of notes that we can just sit there and look things up. What would they think <coughs> of what we're doing with their scholarship? Of what they bled and died for? I hope that you're utilizing. So, Jay, don't be ashamed of looking at that note. You did a good thing. Uh, you did a good thing. It, it is Exodus chapter 19. What is happening in Exodus chapter 19? No. Moses on Mount Sinai and there's something very, very important in Exodus chapter 19 uh, and it is in verse 6. Who's got that? All right, Tammy, read that nice and loud for us, please. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. All right, and who is the you here? Israel. And who is the me? God. So God is, uh, God has just told them, let's back up a little bit. Jack, have you got it? Jack's got a good reading voice. Not that you don't, Tim. I love you. All right, Jack. Back up a verse or two and read to us. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be treasured in possession of me. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Okay, so this is a very important passage of Scripture for, especially for an Israelite, for a Jew, because this is God saying that He has made a special choice of them. Of all the peoples on earth, they are His in a, in a very special way. And they are to be a what did He call them, Jack? Treasure possession. A treasure possession and a what? Kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now let's stop and back up just for a minute because we just said that the distinguishing mark of God's people in the book of Revelation is that they have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. But now when we go back to Exodus, we see that the distinguishing mark of God's people was an election or a calling of God on a particular ethnic group. Where did that change? What has happened? These two seem to be in contradiction with one another. Now, I'm going to stop right here, okay? Because I want you to go home and open your Bible, your study Bible out, do a little digging around, because this Exodus chapter 19, verse 6 passage shows up in another book in the Bible. I'll give you a clue. It's in the New Testament. Don't look yet, because I'm done. So I want you to go and find that other 
uh, that other text in the New Testament. And when we get together next Sunday night, God willing, then I'm going to ask you what happened. Why is it that Sinai, the distinguishing mark of God's people, is an ethnic group, and in heaven, the distinguishing mark of God's people is the blood of Jesus? Got your question? Now, I'm serious. I want you to look it up. The distinguishing mark of God's people. Old Testament, New Testament. All right? I can tell some of, are, some of you aren't taking me seriously, but I want you to go and look it up and do some Bible study. All right? And we'll get into that. And this is an important question. Uh, and we'll treat it next Sunday night. Let's pray, and we'll meet this minutes. Thank you for being here tonight.